Um, let's jump in there. Um, so the first part is kind of like, you know, what is, what is the year ahead going to hold and how can we as local marketing experts help our customers um, make the most of it? Um, ben, I'm going to come to you with this first question. It's a bit of a kind of broad one. Essentially, what, what are you advising your clients to do now um, to take advantage of what you expect is going to happen, you know, in the year ahead of us? So I think we still have a lot of uncertainty as far as what's going to happen, right? You know, we don't know how the vaccine is going to pan out. We don't know if there is going to be a land grab of people going back to stores. Um, I think that, you know, if it's one thing that the 2020 has really shown us is that um, as a digital marketing landscape for agencies, we've been able to adapt very well. Um, I know a lot of agencies and friends that I've worked with, you know, they did, they took a hit in March and April of last year, but, you know, have for the most part seriously rebounded and if anything grown. So um, I think we're going to see a lot of that this year is that we're going to have to continue to adapt. I mean, the, the situation is very fluid. So, um, you know, and we've seen that with like even GMB. I mean, they reacted, they made tons of changes ever since March and they continue to implement more and more changes as the situation develops. Okay. Um, and is there anything kind of concrete you're telling your clients? You know, is it, a, is it a case of invest now for the gains that we think you're going to get or the opportunity that's going to come your way? You know, what we tell our clients is, is look, just keep doing marketing as normal. Do you keep your doing, you know, keep investing into marketing because I mean, right now that's, it's really what you need to do. Um, even though some of them have moved and, you know, are now doing telehealth for instance, and they're just doing online appointments. Um, they still haven't figured out, you know, if GMB is going to allow online people or not, you know, I don't think that's ever going to change, but you know, no, I, from a reality standpoint, I, I, there's nothing much. I don't think that I'm encouraging them to do differently, except just keep on doing what they're doing. Uh, the ones who have pulled back, I think are the ones actually who have hurt the most. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Um, Joy, I guess, same question to you. You know, what's your, you know, what are you advising the clients when you're, you know, speaking to them at the moment about, you know, what they should be doing now? you know, in, in you know, planning for the year ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I won't repeat anything Ben said. I agree on all fronts, but I would say like, if you have downtime, if business is less usual, you know, busy than usual, I would really focus on content. Like some of the best content that we have is written by our clients, not us, right? They're the experts in their field. So um, if you have downtime, think of, or make a list of the top five to 10 questions that customers ask you regularly and, each one of those becomes a, a page on your website. And that's kind of a good way to make it so that when things rebound, you're better than you were before. Okay. And are you seeing, are you seeing a lot of clients have got more time on their hands? I mean, not, no, not with, not with our clients, but I know there's, it, it varies based on the industry, right? So uh, we don't work a lot with like retail and stuff. So I would say, you know, if, if you're in the travel sector, for example, you might have more time. Um, we have some lawyers that are definitely digging their heels more into content because I would say for some of them, it's, it's less busy right now. Um, but if you're working at home services, we've seen the opposite. Um, it's booming like crazy. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Um, Andrew, same question to you. Well, uh, historically, you know, at least my experience, SEO is always underinvested in always like just across any type of business. And particularly across um, multi-location businesses where it's always like the bastard stepchild of like the marketing department or something. And um, what we saw with the um, with the when COVID happened in March of last year, you know, when all the, the lockdown stuff, at least in the states, started to happen. Um, what we saw is people froze their ad budgets because they were kind of panicked, didn't know what was going on. And those who did not have an SEO program were said or had like avoided it, ignored it, were suddenly kind of like caught flat footed. And we're like, oh no, like we got nothing. Um, whereas those who were investing in it were like, this is cool. Or, you know, no one was, this is cool, but they're like, wow, we're not <laughs> suffering um, economically. And so what we saw was clients split into two different types of um, clients. Some were like, let's double down on it because this is awesome. We can own the market now because our competitors are afraid and underinvesting in everything. They're just stopped. And in general, those those clients have done pretty well and continue to do pretty well. And then there are those who are kind of playing catch up 
and are either still kind of have their heads in the sand or um, are kind of just getting started. And so um, I don't know that I have any words of genius to people other than like, hey, you might want to prioritize this stuff. If anything, um, uh, SEO and local SEO in particular uh, are becoming even more critical to the game. Uh, uh, if you look at the, this December update that happened um, and then what keeps seeming to keep happening in January, the local packs are everywhere for, for all sorts of queries that are have like no local intent, you would think, but really do. And so just get started. It's kind of my, what we're telling clients, especially those who've like been avoiding getting started for like six years. Quick question then, Andrew. You said when local packs are everywhere, I presume you're not mean there's volatility in who's ranking. You're just saying that they're appearing for a lot more search queries now than they were before. We're doing a big project right now for a retailer. And the mission is like, okay, how can we um, identify queries with local intent that could generate like an insane amount of money for us over the next year if we target them? And so, um, so we're going through all that data. And what's kind of really standing out is just how many local packs are showing up for keywords that seemingly have, I want to say no local intent, but like low local intent. Like you could basically any kind of e-commerce query. Google, like, like, like we have a, we have a client that um, uh, when the PS5 came out, you know, there's like a retailer that sold the PS5. They're tr like PS5 was a local search, right? It was showing local stores you could buy the PS5 in and e-commerce sites. Um, and we're seeing that for like every kind of query. Like I put in the in Twitter this morning before this thing that grills, G-R-I-L-L-Z is uh, is the local search keyword of the day. Grills is like, you know, that gold stuff you put on your teeth. Um, that's a local search. Right. Okay. Right? Um, so it's everywhere. So, so essentially expanded uh, packs or pack expanded for, for product and service terms, essentially. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, lots more opportunity for us and our clients then. Um, Joy, what's your, you um, Joy, what's your, um, what's your take on, I guess, for those businesses that may be in a slightly kind of more sort of fragile state, um, you know, are you seeing them focus more on kind of customer retention um, and, you know, deepening the existing relationships with existing customers? Um, as opposed to focusing on acquiring new customers. And do you see there, being, there possibly being, you know, more attention put on existing customers and, and holding on to them in 2021? Um, not really, to be honest. I, I think it's more the opposite. Like for the clients of ours that have been struggling because of COVID, like dentists, you know, there's, depending on the area, sometimes they were they were closed and that really killed a few of them that had a lot of locations and had, you know, rent to pay and things like that. Um, so I would say like, they can't even, you know, do anything for their existing customers right now. So I'd say like focusing on new customer acquisition or things that will result in new customer acquisition once they are back open is, is what I would advise doing. Um, cause for a lot of the people that can't do business right now, they can't do business with existing or new customers. Yeah. I guess my, I guess my thought behind the kind of question was, Let's say I haven't been to my dentist now for, you know, kind of nine months, you know, I've almost forgotten who my dentist is. So then I'm going to come back into the, into the market almost like a new customer uh, again, um, because almost my relationship with that dentist is kind of gone and I don't remember much about why I kept on kind of going to them. So I'm wondering whether there's an opportunity for local businesses to, there's almost kind of new customers emerging to the marketplace who are looking or are willing to try something new because they've had such a strong or long break from the business that they used to use. I guess restaurants and cafes, for example, they used to go to, they may be shut. So there's a whole new bubble of consumers out there, um, you know, a whole new opportunity for people who are in the right place at the right time to kind of capitalize. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think if you're out there, then you're going to get, um, you have, a, the potential is huge. Like, like Andrew said, like the people that are actually investing are the ones that are going to pay off long term. You know, I think, Miles, just one thing to add to that is I think that's a, a systemic issue with businesses in general. They're usually looking at how can I get more leads, more leads, more leads, versus how can I nurture my existing customer base? Um, so I, that's been around, I think, <laughs> since internet marketing you know, began, really. Um, and I don't think anything's much different now. You know, Most of our clients are still looking for new customers. 
And when we start talking about, well, how are you doing an email newsletter? Are you doing any retargeting? Do you have any custom, you know, audience set up just for your client base where you can push out information, um, you know, or pull them in? And they're still very resistant to marketing to their own customers. Why is that? What, what, why, you know, you know, surely you could present them with facts saying it's much easier to retain customers and, you know, kind of get that kind of repeat income than it is to go and get a new one. Why are they, why are they so resistant to it? You know, it's a good question. And I think I wish we all had the answer to that. Um, I think it's probably just ingrained in a lot of business people that you need to jump up new business. And that's a big KPI internally. Um, you know, whereas there is a gold mine of new business to be had in existing customer relationships and even previous customer relationships, customers that you've lost. So, you know, kind of going to what you were saying, Joy, is that, you know, I think that as we slowly emerge from our COVID cocoon, you know, we are going to be looking for new types of businesses and new services. And if I was, say, a customer at your restaurant or your dentist, then it might be a good idea to prod me, send me an email, tell me what you're doing from a health and safety standpoint. Why should I come back? Um. Joy, with your clients, I guess picking up on what Andrew said about, you know, I guess people, you know, really running back in on their kind of kind of traditional kind of ad budgets, PPC, et cetera. Um, are you saying that your clients are doing that and, and, and are they coming back and spending on that or is that spend still at a much lower level than it was pre-pandemic? Really varies based on the industry. So some of our clients, you know, rebounded pretty quickly depending on what vertical they're in. Um, some that are still really hurting, um, criminal lawyers is one, um, I think just because of the courts and like how slow everything is. And like one of them joked around that there's not as many people committing crimes. So they're like, we're going to be busy. We need people to commit crimes. What a problem. Um, but, you know, it depends like for for those, I would say that they're still low. But for a lot of them um, that originally like paused their ad budgets or lowered them, a lot of them did come back and and. Um, reload them again. So I think it's just dependent on the vertical, really. Okay. Um, Andrew, what's your, um, you know, I guess kind of going sort of deeper into that, you know, that kind of sort of channel scope due to the SEO and sort of PPC. Um, do you do you think that the customers that are behind on investment in SEO, you know, are they always going to be behind or do you think they've got the ability to kind of catch up with how competitive the landscape is? I think anyone can catch up. It's like, just a matter of prioritization because, you know, not even the, even the competitors who are like all in on SEO, like they're doing other things too. So they're, they're, you can't rank for everything. Right. And, um, and it's such a, in a lot of ways, it's such a low bar, right. It's even though things are competitive in various verticals, but most, in most cases, most of the players out there aren't doing anything. So, um, just by being in the game and doing something, you're gonna see. You should see some improvement. Um, one of the things I've noticed is, is having been stuck at home for such a long time and basically just buying online. Is it you know you buy from Amazon very relentlessly and and other you know large, very proficient kind of e-commerce kind of retailers. You know, I think my expectations as a consumer have become like everything is instant, huge selection, low cost, hyper efficiency. Um, you know, I wonder whether when, you know, is there a problem going to be a problem for local businesses um, when local consumers come back to shopping locally and our expectations are just really up here in terms of all those sort of factors and how, what can local businesses do to win back consumers to show them that the, the buying local experience is better than, than e-commerce? Right. I, I think you, you, you're seeing this already. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing now, but in my experience, every retailer out there is pushing curbside pickup that's like their number one priority for the year, essentially. Um, and just like restaurants are pushing takeout and delivery, right? So um, I think uh, everyone's trying to, to adjust to consumer behavior and, um, and yeah, compete with the, the, the one day or two day shipping with Amazon, right? That's in the e-commerce side, I think that's pretty much all you can do is you need to have, um, you need to have the one day or two day delivery thing, or you need to have make it really convenient for me to drive over and pick something up. Yeah, I noticed I lived in the middle, I live in the middle of nowhere. So like nothing delivers to me. 
And there's a restaurant that's like eight minutes away that's now doing online orders and delivery, which might not sound crazy, but in my area, like nobody's doing that. So I think like people are picking up on the fact that they need to kind of get with the times. <laughs> yeah. Even in rural areas. And, and I think it's going to be interesting at what we're going to see here in 2021. I mean, again, with the, as things kind of rebound is will we change this behavior, which has now become kind of ingrained in us over the last nine months? And we've kind of discovered that, that you know, to Andrew's point, it's like easy, right? Okay, if I want something, I just go to Amazon. I get, I order it. Look at what Walmart's doing with Walmart Plus. You know, they're trying to compete with Amazon. Uh, you know, you've got Amazon Fresh, you know, which is now, which is food. I think that a lot of local businesses are absolutely going to have to continue to, to evolve their business models um, as things change. But one thing I can say, at least personally, is, is that I think that there's certain types of industries or certain types of local businesses that are going to kind of be slightly immune to this shift. Um, like last year, you know, I, <clears throat> I bought a car and I bought a new bedroom set. Well, yeah, I did my research online. But for something which is a high ticket or a highly personal item, I want to feel it. I want to touch it. I want to see it. And I think that's going to still remain to be true. Um, I don't know. Maybe Carvana will work, but <laughs> but I'm not sure. And I guess absolutely the same for service businesses, right? You know, you can't you, know, you can't buy a plumber on Amazon. Well, you can probably hire one, but you can't buy one. So those are businesses obviously will sort of remain immune. With this sort of not, it's not really a hybrid business model, but you know, with local businesses who traditionally you know sold retail, customers came in store having to kind of sell online, go kind of e-commerce, you know, they're not going to, you know, as soon as local consumers come back, they're not going to yank out their kind of e-commerce infrastructure that they kind of sort of put in place. So is this now for, for, for agencies that have traditionally focused on working with local businesses, do they, do you now have to be, have expertise in e-commerce marketing as well as local marketing to be able to serve this new hybrid economic existence that local businesses have? Absolutely. I think it goes both ways. The e-commerce players are also being forced to figure out local, right? Um, because those packs keep getting in the way. Um, so it's a, everything is like, um, I don't know, it's, it's all merging into the same thing, essentially. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that's interesting is like you take a look at um, psychologists, right? Psychiatrists. So they are now all 100%. They're working from home. They still have a brick and mortar office that they have a lease at, but questions that I probably get almost every single week is, is like, so what are we going to do with GMB? Um, we're kind of finding out that let this whole telehealth and telemedicine thing has really worked for our business and it's, but we're still doing things locally, but we're expanding nationally. So a, what do we do with our storefronts in the first place? And then B, how do we expand our footprint now nationally or over to another state? And these are all really still compelling questions, right? Because we don't know where things are going. And we all, and what we don't even know is, is we don't know what GMB is going to do. So I doubt GMB will ever get to a situation where they say, okay, to have a service area business or a storefront, you actually have to have a brick and mortar, right? I don't think they're ever going to get away from that and just allow online only. I could be wrong, <laughs> but I, I don't think so. So anyway, but you know, it's 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 still up in the air, you know, as far as what they're going to do and how they're going to be able to do it. But yeah, I mean, it's, they are treated more like e-commerce these days. Joy, are you with this? Obviously, you know, this you know, the kind of move towards e-commerce or e-commerce and local, essentially being you know requirements to sort of serve a client. Are you seeing a different need and different skill sets and experience in terms of people that you're bringing into your agency? Yeah, I mean, um, something that we actually talked about uh, internally recently is like Shopify, right? Like, I mean, I'd say 90% of our clients are on WordPress sites, but we're starting to see like leads come in from people that have Shopify sites and that's like a whole new platform. So I think being versatile and being able to um, work with multiple platforms, because I've heard different things on what's better for e-commerce, but I know Shopify is like really... Um, simple for people to use, like for businesses to adapt to. Um, so I think like, you know, I would say previously, like a local SEO agency maybe doesn't need to know Shopify, but like now it's definitely a good asset to have for sure. 
And, and beyond the sort of platforms, sort of about, you know, what about kind of other kind of Google integrations and Google opportunities? Do we need to make sure, you know, if we're running agencies that we're really understanding this expanding product set, you know, what should we be kind of getting our heads around? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I've been really trying to hit home with is like the difference between GMB management and SEO. Like people tie those things together and like we do both at Sterling Sky, so we tie them together. But a lot of agencies don't like some just do SEO and they leave out the local or they don't think about local or GMB at all. And then some agencies strictly just work with GMB and they're like focused on things like getting you more reviews or, or helping with, um, you know, keeping your attributes up to date and stuff. Um, if you're just doing GMB management and you somehow expect that that is going to increase your rankings, you're likely going to be disappointed. Um, and if you're just doing SEO, you could be possibly missing out on a lot of things like We've had people come to us that have really reputable SEO companies working with them that are kind of ignoring GMB and the reviews are a mess and like all kinds of things are being missed. So I think just knowing which of those things you're hiring people to do and what your overall outcome in is like really key and people still don't get it. Like, I don't know why, but it seems to be a big misconception. And just to piggyback on that, I mean, what Joy just said is perfect. Um, it's true. I mean, Local SEO and SEO together, you know, Andrew, I think you were saying this prior, right? Is that the things have not changed from an organic SEO standpoint in the last 20 years, technically, um, approaches, right? And local SEO and normal and organic SEO are very tightly tied to each other. I mean, my agency, we are one of the guilty ones, Joy, where we focus a lot <laughs> on GMB, you know, spam and all that stuff, right? Suspensions. Um, however, we do a lot of consulting with our clients at the same time. Um, just coming from that enterprise SEO background, you know, for over 10 years, more than that, actually. But anyway, but they all work together. So you do have to, I think, do both. You can't leave GMB on autopilot. And you definitely can't leave your organic SEO on autopilot. So and then as marketers, you know, I mean, I think you even need to almost start to round that out with either a good partner or you need to learn it in house how to do email marketing um, and also even social media for the right industry. I'm going to ask one more question in this section, and then we'll kind of move on to looking at the kind of trends uh, sort of driving. Um, and I guess the question for each of you. I guess with you, Andrew, do you think 2021 is going to be a, a good year, a great year, or a challenging year uh, as someone running an agency? Um, it's always challenging running an agency, but I think it's going to be a, a, a beyond great year, like amazing year, just like what? every other year in, in SEO. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. Has it ever been a, a non-amazing year for you guys in the SEO world? I've, I'm same opinion as you. I think yeah. that it's definitely more challenging, but I, I don't think that's necessarily because of COVID. I think things are always changing and people's ability to adapt and, and modify their strategies quickly is, is key. Like that's always been true. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that, yeah, I mean, we thrived last year. I mean, I, almost everybody I know actually that owns an agency thrived unless they were just niche on PPC, then they really got hit. Um, you know, and had to let go of a lot of staff and some people didn't rebound from that. But I mean, this year, I think this year is going to be great for everybody. I think our only competition is um, what they call in other industries, non-consumption, right? Meaning like it's an incredibly huge growing market. And so um, you could say, oh, Joy and Ben are our local SEO guides competition, but there's so much business and so many problems to solve. There's like, it's endless. Literally. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I think I shared with you, uh, I was doing some sort of research under the webinar, I was looking at the kind of, the, the US um, sort of census around sort of business applications. Um, and what I found fascinating was that in 2020, um, the number of new business applications in the US rose by 42% versus 2019. And half of that, was in Q4. So literally, there was an absolute explosion of new business applications in the US last year. A lot of them were um, kind of non sort of storefront, uh, so, you know, online sort of delivery. But even actually for the ones that are kind of traditional kind of retail or sort of have, have a sort of physical presence, it doubled. 
uh, I think it's something like that. It was, it was, it was amazing. I mean, you should look at the chart. It's totally off, off it. I guess that would stop me thinking. So there's suddenly going to be, I guess a lot of people have moved from, they had jobs before, those jobs now have gone or disappeared, other income streams disappeared. So they've turned to entrepreneurship. They're taking, you know, their future by the reins and they're going to be, you know, sort of pushing forward themselves. What do you think that means for the marketplace in terms of lots of new business owners coming in who may have very, very little or limited experience and limited sort of budgets uh, to sort of spend on marketing, um, but are going to be wanting to kind of capitalize on all the opportunities? You know, is that, is that, is that fertile on new ground for agencies uh, or is that uh, a lot of tire kickers who are going to need hand-holding through the, 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 the weeds of SEO? Well, that's that's local SEO clients right there. <laughs> How so many no, been, no change. Um, actually, it's kind of um, it's kind of a challenge because um, suddenly, if you're just thinking about local packs per se, suddenly you have like fifty or forty two percent more businesses eligible for local packs, even if they're not doing anything. Just just by being a, a physically located business, they might start taking some share from you. Um, so, uh, uh, but overall, I think. Yeah, that sounds great. More potential people want to do SEO. Great. Yeah, it's going to be uh, a, yeah. Lot, a lot more people are going to need solutions. Is really what it comes down to. Um, I also think that it's a really great opportunity for niche agencies. You know, I mean, take a look at what kind of new kind of you know quote unquote categories of businesses are, are starting to emerge. Capitalize on that. Become an expert. Um, you know, we saw that we've been seeing that like with cannabis, you know, there are agencies that are just focusing just on cannabis and they're doing great. So, yeah, you know. maybe telehealth, as you said, is another one where actually there's just going to be, you know, a huge emerging opportunity. There's the, there's the blending of kind of e-commerce capabilities and local capabilities to create something, you know, a unique skill set. Um, yeah, actually, it's a, it's going to be. It's a host of opportunity uh, for people kind of running agencies or sort of starting agencies. Um, you know, I guess you just got to find out what works for you uh, and what you enjoy doing uh, and focus on that. Um, okay, brilliant, guys. Let's let's move on. Let's talk about, uh, I guess, you know, the trends that we've seen uh, over the last year. Um, Joy, I'm going to start with you because, you know, you said to me, not much has changed uh, last year. Um, do you think anything's going to change this year? Yeah, so just to be clear, so like, Google changes a lot of stuff when it comes to features. So how the search results look and what things contribute to click through rate, that changes a lot. When it comes to ranking factors, that's what I honestly I don't think has changed at all in the last like decade. I mean, if you want to rank on Google, it's links and content slash onsite SEO. And the reviews obviously factor in there too. But like really those are the two kind of pillars. So I don't think that is going to change. I don't think Google has enough especially with COVID, like, you know, you might think like, okay, they're going to use user engagement signals, like driving directions um, or like store visits. I think they're moving in that direction, but I would say COVID's maybe put a bit of a caveat in there since there aren't as many store visits happening. Um, so I think like, no, that I don't think the fundamental ranking things are going to change, but I do think like features are going to change like local service ads launching. That was huge. If it launches in your industry, that is going to change the SERP layout and that's going to change where people are clicking, um, can definitely have a huge impact on your ads account more so than your SEO efforts. So really important to watch the search results like Andrew was saying. Maybe local packs are there now and they weren't there before. That's huge. Um, ben, I guess sort of funny off what Joy said, uh, you know, you've, you've written about and spoken a lot, a lot about sort of local um, uh, local service ads. How how broad is it now in terms of kind of coverage geographically? Because apparently they're in the U in the UK, but I've never seen one. Um, and and kind of industry wise, kind of how how broad are they? And what what impact does it have on let's say traffic from pack or traffic from organic when local service ads are launched? So, a I agree with what Joey just said about features. Absolutely. Um, and B, from what I've seen and heard and uh, with, you know, local service ads is, is that it has absolutely started to cannibalize a little bit of the local pack organic. Um, absolutely. You know, I mean, there's that inherent trust, you know, in that Google guaranteed badge, right? And now with Google screened, that's obvious. Um, however, I haven't seen it. It's not like it's been horrible as far as the drop goes. 
I know Joya has done actually some studies on this and has some real numbers to back this up. So I'm going to pass it to her in about two seconds. Um, but what I have seen also this year, once they expanded it out, is that there's so much competition now is that you're getting a couple people who are rising to the top. They're figuring out how to game local service ads, which is just destroying it for everybody else. And we saw this happen in the locksmith industry. So it's now, so now that even now you got lawyers, tree pruners, all these, all these different industries that can do LSA. That's fantastic. But I think it's fantastic for a few. It's not fantastic for everybody. And on top of that, now we're seeing spam and we're seeing attacks, all sorts of things happening in LSA. So yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, LSA, I think it's still great. It's excellent for early adopters. I just don't know where it's going to be long-term. But Joy, why don't you go ahead and share the results you have? Yeah, so we did a study on 110 different lawyer listings because um, I really wanted to see how it impacted like click-through rate essentially on the local pack results. So we came up with our own metric for click-through rate. We basically looked at like discovery searches by actions. So to eliminate all mm -hmm. the branded searches, um, it made a difference, a little bit of a difference in click-through rate, like comparing before and after. But it was like, I think on average, it was about five clicks that each lawyer lost a month on their listing. So whether that's be calls or, or website visits. So nothing insane. What I what I did after that, uh, we released that study like a month ago. Uh, I have to do a follow up piece because I haven't written this part yet. But I looked in their Google Ads accounts for some of the same lawyers. That's where the hit took place. So like when I was looking at one lawyer, their cost per conversion after lo local service ads launched, it like doubled and their leads dropped in half. And like we saw like insane bad <laughs> metrics on the Google ads front. So that was kind of a learning lesson. Like if local service ads launches for your industry or your area, like pay really close attention to your Google ads account. Cause you might want to scale back spending there. Cause it like does horrible things to your Google ads account. <laughs> really? Well, and what does the conversion from ads or. Yeah. So the main reason for it, like there's two things, some keywords don't even show regular ads anymore. So some of the top converting keywords, there's literally just an LSA pack and that's it. No regular ads. And then in other cases, it's like LSA pack, then ads. But like you can see why the click through rate would drop on the regular ads. They don't look as nearly as good. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a mixture of those two things, a lot of the core keywords that Google knows are high converting keywords. They, you know, remove the ads or like it just overall causes your metrics to look awful. So knowing to scale back and pull some of that money and put it towards local service ads instead is really key. <laughs> Definitely learned that one. Yeah, we, we had a we had a case where um, a mover that we worked with um, it exactly what Joy was talking about happened, and what happened was suddenly they were not able to do like really good keyword targeting on ads, and they were getting um, leads through LSAs for really low dollar projects and paying a high dollar um, fee for the for the lead. And so it totally screwed up the economics of their, their pay-per-click campaign. Hmm. Yeah, I guess the only thing I want to share is just a, a number that I have um, because I was all talking about pay-per-click mainly, and that is how it's affected local, the local pack. And, um, you know, I've been kind of generally screening our clients about this and kind of what kind of drop they're seeing. And we're, we're also looking at their analytics. And we're seeing on average between 15 to 20% loss in actions as far as uh, on Google My Business goes when LSA is introduced into an area. Right, okay. So 50% so loss in fake data? There you go, <laughs> exactly. I was thinking more like 70%, but yeah. <laughs> I've got a question for Andrew, kind of circling back to um, the comment that just uh, that, you know, not much has changed in terms of what impacts ranking uh, in the last 10 years. I think you even said sort of 20 years in terms of organic. So. Does that mean that our strategies don't change? We just do more of the same? Um, hmm. I guess the, yeah, you always want to be adapting your strategy. Um, as Joy was talking about that, actually, it made me think of all the little ways that we try to squeeze juice out of the lemon, right? It's um, so uh, uh, you have to kind of um, take kind of what you're given, which is this decreased SERP real estate and these very rigid Google features that have little ways to manipulate them that might yield a 1% increase or something. 
And so, um, so I don't know if that changes your strategy other than you constantly have to be looking at these things and going, okay, how can I get a little bit more? So in fact, like I saw in, in the question area, someone was asking about Google My Business posts. And like, so that's a really good example of how there was this new thing a couple of years ago. It's kind of clunky. Um, and yet it's really easy to use in some ways and generate really high ROI for a fairly low effort, not huge volume, but great ROI. Um, same thing with, um, with uh, the um, Merchant Center. When Google started making uh, uh, it free to post your, um, post your inventory in there, um, if you kind of had your act together and cleaned up your Merchant Center last, uh, you know, over the last year or so, especially over the holidays, we saw it in November last year, suddenly like all your products were showing up on your GMB pages and for free. And um, so, so kind of just always looking for, um, for those little niches, uh, those little areas of opportunity where you can kind of fine tune your strategy and take advantage of these new things, I think is other than that. Yeah. The strategies haven't really changed too, too much. It's like content and links and technical proficiency. So, Miles, I'll, I'll, do you want to clarify something? Just I don't want anyone to misunderstand that. So when it comes to strategy, I was going to say like the default strategies, you know, links and on-site SEO haven't changed, but like your tactics absolutely should. So using links as an example, um, what ends up happening with link building is some new strategy comes out. Let's say it was like five years ago, it was scholarship link building. Everyone starts using it. The strategy becomes less effective. Currently, I would say it's guest posting. Like everyone's doing it. It's becoming less effective. So when it comes to link building, like, yes, you need that as a strategy. The, the key or the hard part is coming up with a strategy that not everybody does yet and maybe not talking about it. I don't know, like some people share their strategies and then they go viral and then everybody starts doing it. So I know some of the smarter link builders I know don't necessarily talk publicly about what they're doing. So this is where like as an SEO, it's important to like, you know, use tools to diagnose what people are doing instead of just like waiting for them to tell you. I think I think it's hilarious that you said that guest posting is now all of a sudden a new rage. Come on, ten years ago, guest posting was all the new rage. It's like what's old is stupid. new again. Well, uh, just the volume, right? Like I don't know how many of those guest post emails you get a day, but uh, <laughs> too many. The volume turn up, yeah. Too many, but but uh, you know, I, I got to say this is that Google has always been this way. They, they have always said, okay, well, SEOs are going to come out with new strategies that they think are going to basically game the system. They're not going to do consumer experience things. They're going to do things for ranking purposes. So yeah, they will go viral. They will end up, everybody will do it. They'll all, everybody will follow each other off the cliff, you know, like a lemming. And then Google will say, okay, you know what? We're going to deaden that signal. That's all. Okay. Now, now what are you going to do as an SEO? I've got a question for Joy. As, a, as an agency boss, you know you want to, you know, you want to keep your competitive advantage over other agencies. Uh, keep delivering for your kind of clients and doing it better than, than anyone else. What is more important to doing that in your eyes? Um, is it innovation in what you do, or is it just better processes and delivery of the things that you already do? Oh man, can I say both? I mean, like, so processes are key, obviously, like you need, especially if you grow an agency, we learned this growing from like, you know, four of us to uh, now at 17. Um, we learned very quickly last year that like our processes needed to be a lot better uh, and clearly outlined so that when we bring on somebody new, they actually know why we're doing what we're doing. But I would say innovation, I probably would put above because I think having tactics and strategies that not everybody is doing yet, especially if you work with really competitive markets. Like I would say dentists are super competitive. Personal injury lawyers are super competitive. If you have clients in those industries and you're not being innovative, you're going to have a really hard time succeeding. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next thing is, is obviously, um, hopefully everyone is, is aware of the local search ranking factor study. The last one came out in the tail end of last year, run by Darren uh, from WhiteSpark. Um, it was clear that the big winner in terms of a you know, group of factors that are dominant is now everything kind of GMB related. Um, you know, I think it's now worth, you know, it has a cumulative value of a third of all kind of ranking factors can be attributed to something within GMB. Um, actually excluding all the kind of review stuff because that's kind of bracketed off into a, a sort of separate section. So um, 
I guess, what is, is GMB becoming table stakes now in kind of local SEO? Um, and is there much opportunity within GMB, given that we've all got access to the same fields, right? We've all got access to exactly the same tools within a fairly structured setup. You know, how can we, how can we, you know, drive advantage there, where essentially the, the playing field is quite level? Ben, you're, a, you're, a, you're you focus a lot on GMB, so a great question for you. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as GMB goes, I mean, it, it's GMB table stakes. It's like if you are a local business and you're not doing GMB, then you might as well just be giving all of your business away to your competitors is what it comes down to. Um, you know, there's only a couple of elements as far as GMB goes when it affects, you know, rankings per se. Right. But there's a lot of elements that affect the customer, the consumer experience, basically. And so I think as a merchant that if you're not paying attention to those elements and if you're not paying attention to GMB almost sometimes on a weekly basis, then um, you're just leaving a lot of money on the table is really what it comes down to. I mean, we just started seeing like, for instance, with uh, the GMB services, right, which have always been on mobile, you know, now they're starting to show up as these, you know, little snippets basically uh, on GMB listings. It's like, didn't expect that to happen. That's cool, you know? Um, so, you know, they're, they're, it's constantly evolving, constantly changing. So if you're not paying attention to it, then yeah, you're losing out. Joy, Andre, you got a view on that? Yeah, I think one of, one of the key things that I've learned uh, in the last year is like, don't just assume when Google comes out with a new feature that just because it's not visible currently doesn't mean it won't be visible later. Um, so for example, like uh, Colin posted a blog recently on the local U site um, about a test we're seeing that Google's doing where they're actually pulling in stuff from the services menu inside Google My Business into the local pack. So it actually shows there kind of like it does with review snippets. Um, mm -hmm. If you're familiar with those. And so he detailed it all in the blog. It's a test. So you may not be able to replicate it. But, you know, previously we were always like, oh, the services menu, like, so invisible it's only on mobile like whatever so i mean i think it's like a learning experience that like if google launches a new feature just take five minutes and fill it out because you might have some time in the future where they will actually start showing it more visibly and it might matter even if it doesn't currently except for followers you can pretty much ignore those <laughs> you never know <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, where, I guess once you say once you've done all of that, you've done, you've completed all the fields, you've filled in the information, you've you know you've done a, a decent level of, kind of optimization. Is there much is there much more you can kind of do there to kind of get stand out? At that point, do you just you just you flip your attention to other activities, other optimi optimization work where you can definitely create stand out. Andrew, you're 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 nodding along to that. Yeah, because there's not much you can do. Like I said, it's you know, posts and get reviews. And you know, maybe there's a couple other things you can screw around with, but but um, after that, it's all about local organic, right? And, and especially like if you're a service area business, and you know, odds are your GMB isn't going to show up in any results anyhow. So you're you're um, you know, you've got to start to get your site ranking, not just your GMB page. And and by the way, all that work you do on your site is going to help your GMB page rank for stuff too. Um. A good question for Ben. Do you notice that um, within uh, the, the radius that Google's sort of presenting local results back, do you get a sense that it's getting tighter and narrower as more businesses kind of engage in GMB, properly optimize their listings? You know, the bar is being raised, and therefore there are more businesses within a narrower area. Um, and do you see that as as a as a, a dramatic change, uh, or is it kind of industry dependent? Yes. So um, it's a I, what we are seeing actually is a little bit of a dramatic change, but I think it is also industry dependent. For I'd say on average, what we're seeing is is that we're a, a radius. Let's say if you had a radius that was on average about ten miles, right? We've seen that shrink down to about two miles, um, and it's been a pretty consistent kind of message that we're getting from our clients that's saying, "Hey, why am I not? I used to be able to be of." found out here, now I'm, it's only here. So um, so I think that, I mean, proximity has always been number one. And, the, and with GMB, it's the verification address. You know, that has absolutely definitely always been one of the number one ranking factors. So, um, I mean, I would, I would expect that as you get more and more competition that the radius would shrink, kind of like what we saw with Possum with the categories. 
So caveat there, I would say like, it depends on the keyword a lot. So like, I'll use my lawn care client example, and I'm totally, I can't reveal the actual keyword, but like lawn care, right? Is the general term, let's say everybody's tracking for lawn care. So like, yeah, he's confined to a certain radius for that because Google's using the primary category and there's lots of businesses that fall into the lawn care thing. We found a keyword that um, was a variation of near me, like a more specific thing. And like, he's got a one box for like, I want to say 45 to 50 miles, which is insane, but nobody is targeting this keyword because lawn care is not like crazy competitive. I want to say most of his competitors are not investing a lot in SEO. It's pretty obvious, but like the amount of traffic he's getting because of how far away he ranks for that one keyword is crazy. And if you just looked at like the search volume comparison, it wouldn't have made sense because lawn care would always come up way higher. But like when you factor in the competition, that's where I think like sometimes you can see some really big wins by going long tail. And metro area as well. So, you know, if you're taking a look at some uh, a place which is a really large city with a lot of population and a lot of competition, you know, yeah, you're going to probably, it's going to probably be a much more narrow set. You're probably not going to rank as far, but you know, like in a smaller area. Yeah, absolutely. For what it's worth, Grills has about a 60 mile radius. So sweet. <laughs> is that what you're getting? Is that what you're getting next, Andrew? Grills? You know it. Uh, It'll really make me stand out on webinars. Uh, <laughs> 2020 was uh, was a pretty interesting year for you know you know sort of further monetization uh, of um, GMB uh, by Google. Um, obviously, the kind of Google guarantee um, became you know sort of to kind of get rolled out became more prevalent. Obviously, still got a long way to go to kind of fall in line with the full sort of LSA uh, coverage. Um, do you expect to see more monetization activities in 2021? And if there was one thing you think I reckon they're definitely going to do that, what would it be? I would say the Google guaranteed badge. So sorry if you're trying to look up the post for this. It was like, I don't know, it's like three pages back, probably on the local U blog, but there's a um, label that shows up actually on Google Maps listings and the, it's testing, but like, it's really limited. Like I've barely been able to spot it myself and Tom Waddington, I think who told me about it, even on the example he sent me, I don't see it there anymore. Um, but Basically, it's like if you're in the Google Guaranteed program, so local service ads, they actually give you a label, but in the organic results, like so it says Google Guaranteed right in the local pack and then right on your Google Maps listing. I think that's huge, like um, the mixing of organic and paid. And if they do roll that out, which I think they will, but like, you know, I'm not I, I don't have a crystal ball. But um, if they were to roll that out, I think that might have a decent impact on click through rate. I, I agree with Joy. Google screened, but the I guess if I had to pick one feature that I think that they will monetize this year, I think it might actually come down to booking. Um, mm -hmm. Since companies are more, you know, we're more virtual at this point, right? And we're doing the online scheduling. Um, you know, I think the the hint that was kind of dropped, you know, between like the product and the feature feeds, right, is that. Um, they uh, put like, you know, the ability to do online scheduling and they teased it with something, a feature that doesn't work currently, which, you know, is the, you know, the ability to add like a Zoom link or a Google Meet link or something like that to your profile. Um, I think it's half baked at the moment and, just, and it's just testing. But <clears throat> yeah, I can imagine them rolling out booking to almost any type of industry and uh, even marketing agencies you know, and either having a booking provider, you know, or charging and having their own platform where they do some kind of middleman. Hmm. That sounds very worrying. <laughs> or it could be great. Yeah, uh, well, mm, yeah. I mean, it's I mean, just, uh, you know, Google trying about to it. force themselves in between you know, us and customers, uh, you know, and, and take their slice. Um, with the get a Google guarantee um, sort of badge, um, as long as that is not, it's it's really there hopefully to kind of drive or improve conversion and not a ranking factor. Do you ever see it maybe becoming a ranking factor in terms of Google Google wanting to surface businesses that it can trust more to consumers? No, no, I don't think so. Would you ever recommend it? Uh, the use of it to a business that was let's say was, was ranking outside the top twenty? You say, look. 
do this because it's great or don't do it until you get inside the top three. Absolutely, because I think that's like a misconception with ranking. You rank somewhere, maybe just not the keyword you're looking at or where you're searching from, but you, every business ranks somewhere for something. So yeah, I would add it. Really, do you think they all rank high enough to so that people would actually see the Google guarantee? Well, I mean, I a good way to check would look inside your insights, right? I mean, you can see in there how often you're being seen, but I've yet to see one where it's zero. And, and think about just brand queries, right? Mm -hmm. You'll show up there. Yeah. And it, yep. might, it might be enough to get someone to click on you. I, I yep. think, it, yeah, a catch-all statement could be is, is if Google's giving it to you, take advantage of it. Yeah, they can take it away, sure. But why not take advantage of it? And not to mention, I mean, like with Google, uh, I think it, it, no, it's Google screened actually. Google screen gets you like into voice searches, for instance. You know, that's a low hanging fruit, easy way to get into it. I believe they're doing it with Google Quick Guarantee Badge, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. When you say they're giving it to you, they're not really just giving it to you. They are charging you $50 for the pleasure of, uh, of giving it to you. <laughs> Very true. Very you true. need to expect that you're going to have to give Google your money. Like if you're fighting that, like you're not going to win. Like Google wants your money. They're going to find ways to take it. If you're a business owner, this is the cost of doing business. It's like the yellow pages 10 years ago. You have to pay. Yeah. Um, question for Ben. You, you, when we talk about the kind of agenda, you brought up the kind of, you know, the, I guess the rise and rise of zero click searches, uh, you know, essentially where Google presents back so much information in the SERP that people don't have to click through to your website uh, to, you know, choose you or kind of sort of select you. Um, what do you think is the, the material impact of a rise of uh, zero click searches on, on businesses, you know, their ability to attract customers and, you know, in a profitable way? So um, I think it was Mike Bloom. Well, I know it was Mike actually quite a few years ago, you know, he came up with the, the, the phrase, you know, Google is the new homepage, right? And we've kind of seen uh, Google kind of stampeding towards that goal. Um, just over and increasing that over the past you know year or so, so I believe that you know I mean obviously Google wants to keep you on Google.com. They want to keep you in the mobile app. They, you know that's where they're making their money, and so the more information that they can have you put into Google, say by a Google My Business, um, the better it is obviously for them. But also on the flip side, it's better for the consumer themselves. So if I can look and see and do a search, you know, for say lawn care, and I'm going to get my organic answers, I'm going to get my ad answers, I'm going to get kind of Google my business answer. As a consumer, I don't know the differentiation between these things. So, but if I can do all of my transaction right from there, I can just click a button to call or I can click a button to buy or I can click a button to message. Um, which all of these things, you know, are reality, then why do I need to go to the website at this point? Because you've given me all the information as a consumer to make my just to make an informed decision, basically. So tactics for business to make the most of that then? I would say definitely filling out GMB as much as possible. You know, do the questions and the answers, you know, answer your clients' questions, do posts. Um, you know, those can drive, like Andrew was saying, amazing conversions, especially with, you know, the now the fact that they have the message button on them, um, you know, which we're seeing clients getting a lot of uptake when it comes to the messages. And, um, you know, then on your organic side, you know, again, it's all about answering questions that people have, you know. And, yeah, I mean, they might see it. They might be able to see right in the title, right in the description you know, the answer that they need. And then they're just going to go ahead and maybe go move right straight over to GMB and then click on call. Um, we are up to, sort of up to the sort of hour mark. Um, I do want to talk about kind of GMB spam specifically uh, as, a, as a kind of topic before we jump into the Q&A. So let's, let's give that a little bit of air time and then we'll leap straight into uh, the kind of Q&A. Um, Andrew, do you, do you do much monitoring of spam? Is that something that uh, is a, a sort of an issue for your clients? Um, with our, uh, usually with clients in certain verticals like legal, it's kind of a thing. Um, most, in most cases we haven't had to deal too much with it. Um, but, um, yeah, we've certainly seen your fair share of, uh, keyword stuffing and, um, fake addresses and all that kind of good stuff. 
Yeah. Um, what do you think is the trajectory of spam in GMB? Do you think it's on the up and up and it's, you know, it's unstoppable? Feels that way. Right. I'm, I'm sure they're always trying to fight it, but it's, it's, um, I, I can't remember exactly what they said, but I had the opportunity to talk to a GMB product manager at one point. Um, and he was basically like, yeah, we're trying to fight the, the resources are to fight the stuff that's like deadly. And everything else is like, we'll get to it if we can, was kind of like the vibe. Um, so uh, I'm not optimistic that it'll go away anytime soon. And I'm sure you're itching to answer that question. You know, where, 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 where is spam going? And is Google ever going to do anything concrete about it? <laughs> well, okay. So uh, fair enough. Um, yeah, we, we actually, we, we fight uh, spam at scale for our clients. And um, <clears throat> so, no, spam's not going anywhere. Um, if anything, it's going to intensify. You know, I mean, typically what you see is you see about a, a three to five month cycle on new spam type of networks. So, <clears throat> and also techniques. Um, those usually have about a six to eight month cycle uh, with about a two to three month lull. So, but that's been constant over the past couple of years. Um, well, about two years, really, to be specific. And spam was even there before that, but it's intensified. I think Google does their best um, with what they can. I think they are not perfect. Um, I believe I agree 100% with Andrew. Um, is that you know they're looking for what they call misleading and fraudulent information, right? And that in some cases they just do have to kind of ignore things that are not going to harm a merchant or harm a consumer, uh, whether that perce uh, perceived harm is real or not. Um, you know, they still have really bad ways of dealing with like, you know, private residences, um, really horrible ways of dealings with service area businesses. And, you know, I mean, they've gotten better though this year, like with virtual offices um, for the most part, and also UPS stores. Like we see tons of like suspension loops when it comes to UPS stores. And also we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, like virtual offices immediately go into suspension, which is awesome. And yeah. to the garage door industry, which anybody who follows me knows that I've been working in the garage door industry really hot and heavy last year. And I'm, I don't even know how many listings we've taken out for that too many. Um, but with that industry, you know, now we're seeing a lot more of garage for listings going into a pending status um, right on verification. And this is a lot because a lot of us PEs, of course, have been talking to Google about that. But that's one kind of tactic that they've put into place now to kind of I wouldn't say um, stopping spam is, is, I think, the way wrong phrase. Curtailing spam, maybe, I guess, is a good way to look at it. So, yeah, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Okay. Do you, um, maybe, I guess, Joy, do you think Google's, you know, wants to reduce spam? And more specifically, you know, I think a lot of the kind of stuff, you know, GMB um, title name stuffing seems to be like a, such a, a massive problem and kind of culprit. Surely they can fix that. <laughs> Problem with Google is that the stuff they're fixing this year, for example, are tactics people started using three years ago. So like Ben's absolutely right. Virtual offices don't work as well as they used to, but like people have moved on to new strategies. So um, I think Google's report in 2020 said they removed 4 million listings in 2019. And then the year before that, it was 3 million. So it's definitely going up. Um, where I think they have the most improvement needed is reviews. Review spam is like, horrible like they've made in my opinion no progress there the most obvious fakest reviews are flying through and like it is a real problem and i i really wish the media and like laws would do more to protect consumers against that because that's in my opinion the trend that's like it's just there it's there's there's no progress or movement in my opinion yeah, we even I had this one case which was really interesting. Uh, it was actually a triangulation between three different lawyers, and one of them, and this ties back to LSA. One of these lawyers wanted to be basically number one, two, and three in local service ads. 
So what they did was, is they set up these two other PIs and they made it look like this one PI was leaving negative reviews over here. And this other PI was leaving positive reviews over here and they were scraping Yelp results basically and just copying and pasting. Why I, why I totally agree with what Joy is saying is that in this circumstance, one of those lawyers was able to get all of the negative reviews removed because they could prove that they were scraped from Yelp. The other lawyer, same week, different report, Google would not remove any of them at all. Same pattern, same city. And so, you know, it's like, okay, so they're not able to, yeah, anyway, yeah, it's frustrating. So all in all, we can expect the spam is, is here to stay for some time. Not going anywhere. <laughs> not going anywhere. Um, it's interesting, you know, with it and it's seeing how, how impactful kind of removing sort of spam can, can be, and Betty, you, you do a lot of this, you know, when we query our customer base, you know, primarily agencies and, you know, kind of SA consultants, you know, very, very few of them actually actively offer spam fighting as a, as a sort of service or an element of the service. So I was yeah. trying to kind of correlate why that is. If it's, if it's a big problem, it's rising, the service is absolutely needed and it has an impact. What is stopping more agencies and consultants embracing it um, as a tactic? So the first thing I'll say is this, and I say this, I think on every single webinar when we talk about spam, is spam fighting is the easiest win in local SEO. Now, let me take back the word easiest and address your address your the question. And that is this, is that I feel that a lot of, well, actually I know this, a lot of uh, digital agencies will try and spam fight um, and they'll fail because A, they don't understand what Google's looking for, number one. Uh, number two, they just don't have a lot of experience with it because when you're spam fighting, I mean, you can read all the articles you want, but literally it's like you have to experience it. You've got to document your results and then you got to be able to adjust those results on a scroll on kind of a rolling basis because Google changes things internally all the time and they don't tell us these things. So you've got to see, it's like, okay, well, this week, how are we doing with service area businesses? How are we doing with homes? How are we doing with virtual offices? How are we doing with name spam, et cetera? So uh, to make that nice and short, I think it's because they just don't understand what kind of results or how or when they're going to get the results. Uh, like I saw a question kind of go into the feed about the redressal form. You know, redressal form frustrates a lot of people. And that is because uh, like what we see, for instance, is we'll see most of our actual active results are going to happen with literally within one, it's usually one week of submission, sometimes same day, um, three days, you know, I'd say anyway, is the expectation, but sometimes one day. And then basically Google will action usually on about 50% about of what we submitted on average. And then um, we have a, a lot of internal processes around this, but you know we kind of like do kind of a, a daisy chain around three different types of uh, tactics. But you know, and that gets us up to around seventy percent removal, I guess, on average, something like that, depending on the industry. But yeah, anyway, just to get back to what you're saying, I think it's just because they haven't found success, and so they give up. Right. Yeah. So it's challenging for them. You know, it's you know, it's, it, it can, it's not actually an easy an easy tactic. It's easy if you have spent the time and effort to really understand it and build processes around it, and you can systematize it. But if you're starting from scratch, actually, you know, it's not that straightforward because there's lots of sort of subtle nuances to it. And you know, 50% success rate that's probably better than link building, but uh, um, you know, it's still somewhat ideal. Look, um, guys, let's jump into questions because I know the uh, the kind of audience are itching for us to do to do that. So thank you for that. That was um. Uh, really detailed, really insightful. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically. There's so many questions. I'm gonna take one question, one panelist. Yeah. Uh, so apologies if, uh, and if, if you don't like the question or you don't feel qualified to to answer it, um, you can skip it. You can basically nominate someone else. Uh, that'll be fun. Uh, okay. So uh, first question. Uh, it's come from John Young. Had 14 upvotes. Um, uh, Andrew, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, well, Google. Uh, I didn't pass it off to the joy room. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, go. 
Uh, will okay, I'm gonna read this out. Hopefully, you can translate really properly. Will Google come off of their brick and mortar only stance for businesses who work from home but use a UPS store mailbox as their business address in 2021, with more and more businesses shifting from commercial office space locations? So, I guess probably in result of the pandemic, people sort of shifting their locations and. Yes, I, I, I think it's I'd say yes, except for the UPS store thing, right? That's that's the problem. Like find a better place to get it, get your mail. Um, uh, but um, right now, um, I'm actually curious, Ben and Joy, if you're seeing this, um, uh, we're seeing verified businesses that have been on GMB forever that are home addresses and are kind of legitimate home addresses. The minute you make a change to them, you get suspended. Yeah, that, that's another spam fighting technique, basically. Yeah. That that's so being... don't touch your don't touch your home address business right now. Well, I, I I I actually will push back on that. So right. yes, it, yes, GMB is very sensitive right now. But when really hasn't it been sensitive? And number two, well, <laughs> that should okay. So that's number one. But number two is that. If you're a legitimate business and you've got your ducks in a row as far as your business proof, you're only going to be suspended for 24 to 48 hours. Well, four days right now. You're not going to be suspended that long. So go ahead, make the change. If the if you need to make the change, yeah, if you get suspended, go for a reinstatement. I know I kind of say that nonchalantly, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's just say your mileage may vary. So yeah. Um... <laughs> It's like, I guess it's like, what kind of risk are you up for? That's, that's the way to think about it. Yeah. You all in on the market or do you have your cash under your mattress? That'll tell you what to do. Um, excuse my ignorance. How does Google, uh, is, it, is it anything that you change? You know, even sort of, you know, a, a minor, uh, a minor field within, uh, within the kind of GMB dashboard. We, that, we, had, we, had one, we had one client just add like a, in the service menu, added a service. Not a controversial service, just added a service and yeah. spend it within a second. Yeah, it's basically, it's called an integrity check is what it is. Um, and forcing a manual review, basically, of the listing. I, I had one that was really funny the other day where uh, Google Assistant actually was calling the business like five times during the day to update the hours for New Year's Eve. And the merchant then uh, said, yes, we're open 24 hours. And then um, the assistant pushed the update as a, you know, accept all changes. They accepted all changes and they got suspended like immediately. I saw that happen a couple of times during New Year's Eve. That totally sucked for the merchant. Yeah. Uh, Joy, so ben, Joy so go ben, for it. Joy's got something to say. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I, I, I don't know. I'm maybe somewhere in the middle. I think uh, I wouldn't hold off on making major changes because you're afraid of suspension, but um, I think it it's, depends on what that change is, right? If it's just a service, maybe maybe not. Um, but if it's something that's like vital, like changing your address, then yeah, I, I think you need to change that. And it's just some, um, obviously Google is kind of triggering this. There's an integrity check. So it's an intentional plan for them to try and sort of target businesses that aren't, aren't kind of legitimate. Um, if you change something, you get it reviewed, you get you know uh, unsuspended. If you change something again, does, does this integrity check have to happen every single time? Depends on the category. So, so like you, if you're, you know, if you're a locksmith, if you're a garage store, if you're real estate even, um, you know, you are going to be in a much higher risk category than if you're a restaurant or a mall or something like that, you know, or a franchise. Um, you know, we're, we're not seeing a lot of the, oh, well, actually, I take that back. We are seeing a lot of franchises that are still that are being affected by this type of thing as well, too. So, but yeah, category is where I'm going to say. Wow. Google must be made, creating an, an awful lot of extra work for themselves uh, in this kind of blanket approach. I wouldn't say that. Not really. No? Um, you know, I mean, the, the fact is this, uh, the, I, I, I don't want to eat up too much time on this, but um, is that at a lot of there's there's mis, uh, misconception out there that reinstatements just take this ungodly amount of time to get done. Um, 
even when COVID struck back in March of last year, you know, when we all, the, the product experts, when we, when we counter war rooms with Google, one of the first things that we said was, is that reinstatements have to be number one priority. And they have throughout uh, the year kept reinstatements at a number one priority. And so, no, reinstatements are happening literally and have been happening, except for this one period of last year where it took a couple of weeks. Um, you know, pretty much been on the ball 24 to 72 hours. You know, I say 24 to 48, but it's really 24 to 72. No, they've been on the ball. I mean, getting reinstated is actually very easy if you're in compliance. However, 99 out of 100 are not in compliance. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move on. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, I want to just jump down one. Uh, another answer from Martin had 12 upvotes. It says, um, will reputation management be a huge trend in 2021? Uh, Joy. So I think keeping on top of like what reviews are against Google's policies, this is something that I think has changed a little bit. Um, so Mike Blumendahl did a really good piece on masks because he had a chain that he worked with up over at GatherUp. And they had a, a giant amount of negative reviews due to their um, store policies on masks. So people were pissed about it. They left a lot of negative reviews for this one retailer all about their mask policies. Um, Mike brought that to Google. They had to make a decision on like, are these okay? Are they not? And they actually ruled in favor of the business, which I want to say they never do. <laughs> um, so they deemed that mask reviews are political in nature. So you can get them removed. So in Mike's case, all of them got removed, um, which is huge, like huge win for them. But I think like keeping up, keeping up with that type of thing, that's something that could change. Um, Google, when things come up in the media and like there's a lot of um, stuff going on with it, they can definitely change their stance on review policies. And that's something I would pay attention to. Um, it, it, I guess sort of reputation signals jumped up, didn't they, uh, in the ranking factor study? Uh, last year, I can't remember the the stats, but it was definitely one of the one of the kind of growth areas, isn't it? I mean, I think reviews have always been important, so maybe people are just starting to realize that. But I do think like that's one of the fundamentals. I would say that it has been true. It was true ten years ago. It's true today. Um, yeah. I okay. Think All right. Yeah. Thanks. Joe. We'll uh, we'll take that as yes then. Um, ben, I might just double back to you actually quickly on this one. Someone said um, basically. Advice on getting fake negative reviews removed. Could you just run us through quickly the bullet point steps? You've got, you got some reviews you want to get removed. What are the, what are the steps you need to take? Yeah, th there's a very specific process for this, actually. So you need to flag the review first in your, in your dashboard. And then you have to wait, I believe it's three days, right? Yeah, three days. Um, then once you've done that, and if Google has not replied to you with a positive or a negative result by email, uh, at that point, then you can go ahead and you can reach out to support and you can basically detail out and plead your case as to why you feel they need to be removed. If they're like, if you're saying that, oh, well, this is an employee. Oh, well, sorry, you are kind of SOL. They are not going to take a look at your employment documentation. That's a privacy concern issue. Uh, you say it's a competitor. Again, you're kind of SOL unless you can really, really prove it. Um, if it is a, like a, say a three or four star or one star, no content style of review, then at that point, again, you just kind of fall into an SOL type of category unless there's a very specific pattern that you can prove. For instance, saying that this person left it for, say, this attorney and this attorney and this attorney and gave this attorney a positive five star review. Um, if you can prove it's a network, then you're going to have a much higher chance. The biggest piece of advice I can give for everybody and anybody on this is, is that if you need to get rid of reviews and you want to try and get rid of them, is do as much documentation as possible document every single link, go to that review, grab the share a link, um, our share review link, because when you submit this to Google help, or if, if Google help won't help you and then you come to the community where the PEs are, we'll look at these reviews and we'll see if they're something that we think that Google viably will get rid of, but you need to come prepared with all of your information and documentation um, because I'm sorry, Google's human, we're human, we all have a limited amount of time. 
So come prepared, present the information, and you may not like the answer, but at least you are going to get an answer. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm going to jump on to the next question uh, from uh, from Jeff. Uh, I'm going to get to Andrew. Uh, how beneficial are GMB posts really? Um, you know, is it more of a sort of signaling factor? I have a hard time figuring out um, how to get a GMB post in front of users. Uh, so in our experience, they're 99% for brand queries. That's where you use them. And they're basically to convert people already know who you are because they're searching for you um, to get them in the door and do something. Uh, there is some evidence that uh, after about a week or so, the, um, the content of a, of a GMB post will show up in, um, I forgot what they called them, in indications or something. Is that what they call them? Indications, the yeah. little little words that show up in your in the local packs that say, "Oh, this site yeah. mentions handbags or something." Um, justifications. 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 Yeah, um, and uh, so um, so like we said earlier, they're a. Uh, I wouldn't be using them as a SEO thing, like in the way you think of SEO. Can it help me rank better? Uh, I'd be using it as a conversion thing for people who are already looking for you. And, it, and just to give you an idea, I think our best performing post campaigns, um, we're seeing about a 15% conversion rate, which is insane. Um, it's on very small numbers though, but if your service or your product has high value, that's a really great ROI. What, what is that conversion from what to what? Meaning someone clicked on a post and booked an appointment or bought something. Okay, fine. So an actual, an actual hard conversion as opposed to view to click, which is you know sort of further right. up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No CTR on it, especially when you've got like a let's say a, a big brand or something. The CTR on it's going to be very low, depending on what the offer is. Let's just say. But like we're seeing, we're doing one for a. Uh, so we built this technology so we can like post to like a billion GMB pages at once. Um, and uh, we're doing a, a, a campaign for a retailer uh, that you guys have heard of with a lot of locations. And the the campaign, the, the, the CTR in it is like 0.1% or something because there's so much brand queries for them. Um, but the, the clicks themselves do pretty well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, make, makes, a little, makes a little sense. It's certainly kind of worth doing. Not a ranking factor. We'll drive some additional conversions. You know, and they're, they're cheap to do if you if you have a process. They're really not expen it's not an expensive thing. Yeah. Okay. A uh, question for Joy then: uh, Will the new GMB performance data be more useful than the existing past insights data? Oh my gosh, yes. So the key thing with the new the new data is that they clump it by month. Like I can't tell you as a marketer how annoying daily graphs are. They are like impossible to look at. You're just like, oh, there's all these spikes. So the fact now that they have calls, and I love that they're focusing on actions, like that's the default is calls. Um, and then it shows you month over month for six months. Um, I really wish they would do, you know, longer than six months. So you could see year over year, that would be much better. But, you know, I'll take what, what they give us, which is a small improvement. <laughs> what is I, I, I wish they would do the, um, the, the keywords the same way they do it in the search performance report in Search Console. So they actually will be useful. Yeah, seeing those for six months is also really good. Like you couldn't see that before. Um, and I think now it should be real time. It was not real time before. They were just the last quarter was you guess. Could have been last quarter, could have been the quarter before last quarter. They like they didn't tell you, but it was not real time. It's still, but it just the way it's presented is almost useless. It's like, okay, those are the keywords. Great. Yeah. Yeah. They're good to look at though. And you can see six months at a time, which is like more useful than one month for sure. I personally love the search queries, you know, and how they're migrating them now and they're moving out more to the, uh, I guess what everybody calls the direct edit experience. But, you know, now everything is basically being uh, migrated over to GMB, basically web in a sense, right? Or I'm sorry, Google web. And um, so, but the, also uh, the, the one thing I love about the performance reports is the fact that you can do year over year analysis very easily. Just select your months, hit apply, boom, and it'll tell you year over year. So that's really great for businesses that are seasonal. So hang on, it's six months, but you, it gives you an annual comparison. Is that right? Correct. Right, okay. 
Uh, George, you know if they're keeping the API uh, as 18 months? I would think so. Uh, I haven't heard of any changes on that. They, they yeah. make API release updates all the time. So that's kind of continuing to expand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question for Ben. Um, do you see Google changing the ranking factor um, of, the, of, the, of the name of the location uh, this year in terms of you know, de-emphasizing how much impact the uh, GMB title has? Oh, so do you want a prediction or an opinion? <laughs> <laughs> um, prediction is, is that um, I think that, no, I don't think they're going to get to it this year. Um, we've been fighting for that for such a long period of time that, yeah, it's just not going to happen, unfortunately. I don't think so. You're not, sure. fighting hard, you're not fighting hard enough, Ben. <laughs> Every single person wants it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be done. It's got to be done. Every, you know what, everybody, you can thank every single one of us PEs because we fight for this thing like, gosh, some to, at least a couple times a week, something like that. I don't know that I want it to change. It's such a great thing to take advantage of. <laughs> <laughs> so Why are you great. making my job harder, Ben? <laughs> Andrew, next question for you is how do you beat someone whose uh, company name is the main keyword? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Like, uh, um, uh, so again, I think it's actually to Joy's point earlier, um, cause everything all roads lead to Joy in local search, um, that, uh, uh, if you can't beat them, you go around them, right? Why waste your time trying to beat someone who's just always going to rank number one for a lot of stuff. Um, when there's a billion other queries and tactics to, to get traffic, um, and so, yeah, maybe your long-term goal is to outrank that guy. Um, and you could, you might be able to do it through um, a good enough link building campaign and you know, getting some great reviews and all that kind of stuff. But while you're waiting for that to happen, I'd be like, let's go after all these long tail things. Yeah, okay. Um, no, thank you very much. Um, easy. Joy, question for, you, uh, question for you, Joy, about suspension. So this actually isn't to do with home-based uh, businesses. It's to do with uh, fully staffed brick and mortar offices. Uh, Isma says, I work for an agency, we manage a lot of listings for our clients. Since November, we've been seeing a lot of listings being suspended while updating any field in GMB. Um, you know, obviously, we talked earlier about sort of home-based businesses, but this is happening, you know, seems more and more to kind of brick and mortar offices as well. Any reason why that might be happening? <laughs> I mean, that doesn't sound good. It's, it's not something my agency is facing. So I would say there might be something wrong with your processes, like how you're accessing listings. Um, I mean, I know suspensions is more Ben's thing. So, I mean, I don't know. My advice would be hire Ben for a couple hours and get him to audit your processes. So, we're, we're um, I'll just jump in real quick. Thanks, Troy. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, basically, so we've been seeing a large uptick in suspensions actually when it comes to brick and mortars. Um, we even had a mall <laughs> in December, right before Black Friday, the entire mall got suspended. Um, but it was actually justifiable. They were trying to create listings inside the mall for like a slide or for the food court. But these things are against the guidelines. You cannot do this. There's other specific, there's other guidelines for that. So uh, they did that. They got an account level suspension. You know, uh, we saw a entire network of rehabilitation, not rehab centers. Uh, they got suspended in March due to updating a COVID link to a PDF link. But then because they had 15 people uh, in the mix, everybody started creating new listings in the same, in the same account. Well, guess what? They've been suspended since March. Now they're finally out after they hired us. So, um, so yeah, I would say absolutely. Make sure your processes are in order. Number one, read the guidelines. I can't state that enough read every single page of the guidelines, every single word. And do not look at your competitors, do not copy your competitors because that's what's getting storefronts in trouble these days is they're adding keywords to their names, they're going out, they're getting multiple locations, they're putting them at employees' homes. Again, these things are all going to put you in jeopardy. And there's a follow-on question actually from Eric Worthington. It says, my local appliance repair business was recently suspended on GMB. They're working with me, but it's very slow. Um, you know, I guess any, any, any tips for helping them speed up the process then? 
I mean, he did ask about avoiding suspension. You mentioned, you know, read the guidelines, fully understand that, and, you know, don't step outside of them, which would be yeah. the, the best advice. But in terms of trying to get things to be sped up in Google, um, anything that uh, Eric can do? Okay, so the, the uh, what we were talking about before still stands true, and that timeline for reinstatements is actually very, very tiny. Okay, so it's all about um, to speed things up, you need to be able to present your case and you have to do it with no emotion. Um, I can't see, <laughs> Joyce, Joy knows what I'm talking about here. And that is, is that every time somebody gets suspended, they cry about how much money they're losing. They're losing millions of dollars a day. They can't put their kids through college. They're gonna lose their mortgage, you know, blah, 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 blah. Google does not care about this. They don't care that you spend X amount of dollars. They don't care about how much money you're losing. The only thing they care about is, is that the information that you're providing to the consumer is accurate period, stop. So keeping that in mind, how do you speed things up? Understand that mentality. And if you understand that mentality, now you can say, I updated my hours, I got suspended, here's my st storefront signage, here's a picture of my car, here's my utility bill, whatever you've got that matches Google My Business, and just give it to them. And you'd be surprised, you'll get reinstated unless there's something more complicating going on, of course. Brilliant, that's very clear, Ben, thank you. Um, uh, Arthur has asked a great question that we are just not gonna be able to answer. It's, it's basically, how, he'd love to learn how to do SEO for large brands, um, you know, how to be unique and local while still having you know, consistency across locations. Someone has kindly said, Andrew Shotland is the guy to talk to you about that, he absolutely is. Uh, and we did a couple of webinars back in the middle of last year as part of our local search clinic was doing, um, doing kind of local local SEO at scale, uh, which involved Andrew uh, and also uh, Dan, who works with Andrew as well. So I would say, watch that webinar, and I'll ask Jamie to put a link in the kind of chat for it, uh, and then also get in contact with Andrew, uh, because um, you know, he, he's the man for that. It's, a, it's an enormous question uh, with a very long answer that we probably can't do justice to <laughs> at this point in time. Uh, although, you know, uh, and in fact, we had a whole hour long webinar about it and it's just been shared. So thanks, Jamie, for sharing that. Um, Andrew, uh, question for you then. Um, any tips for getting in the map pack for something like St. Louis flat roofing companies when the client is actually quite far away from the St. Louis city center? Hmm. Um, yeah. Um, well, so in no particular order, um, get an actual physical location in the city center. That is your cheapest and fastest way to do it. Um, uh, and everyone's like, oh, I can't do that. Like that's expensive. No, it's expensive to create a boatload of content and get a boatload of links that try to influence a machine to think that you're in the center of St. Louis. And that by the way, the physical location, it will stick around for forever. The links and content won't. Okay, um, good view. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Joy, question for I'm, you. I'm sorry. Wait, well, let me. I'm, so I'm being partly facetious, right? <laughs> it's not like you can't do anything, right? But it's really that's what it comes down to is that trade off. And so if you're not prepared to invest a lot in in links and content that makes the machine look like you're located there um, and relevant to that that area. Um, then you should either consider the physical location or start thinking about the same topic we've been talking about. Just like, okay, what do I do to get in the local organic? Like, why can't I compete with Yelp and yellowpages.com and all these sites that show up right below the pack? And then what are all the long tail queries that I can show up for and stop worrying about that head term? Yeah, and I don't think it's a, a, a facetious answer. The reality is that if you're not located in the place you're trying to rank for, you're not going to appear in the, in the map pack, particularly in a, in a in an industry and in a location that's even semi-competitive, you know. It's well, you can do it. It's just like it's it's going to require continual investment to keep, stay there, and it's going to you're not going to like the ROI. I think. Yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of faster ways to fast track kind of getting in there, you know, such as establishing a genuine office location in a place, uh, and if that's where all your businesses come from, then that's probably a pretty good pretty good expenditure. Uh, it's and, actually. Yeah. And, and it's it, for these service area businesses, there's actually all sorts of amazing strategies that way because there's tons of neighborhoods that have business spaces where there's nobody, right? Like just down the street from me is an empty like strip mall. You could probably pick up a cheap space there right now and you could own this neighborhood for whatever roofing or whatever you're doing. 
Yeah. yeah. I, I can't agree with Andrew more. I mean, it, this is a business decision. It's not an SEO decision. It's an SEO decision secondarily. The fact this is, 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 go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. I'm saying this is the challenge with being in this really weird marketing channel called SEO is no one takes this kind of thing seriously. They think you're just, oh no, you're just about getting me ranked in Google, doing these things that I would never do as a business. If I, if SEO didn't exist, I would never do this thing. And um, it's like, no, it exists. And there's real business stuff you can do to affect your SEO. Um, the problem we see, um, and I'm not bitter about this at all, is that uh, people, decision makers don't take SEO seriously to actually consider that, oh, wow, we could really actually get a physical space as a real strategy, right? Because some goofball who does webinars told me this, right? <laughs> Um, let, let's do five. Let's do five more questions, uh, guys. And we've 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 overrun, which is uh, what we always do. But uh, anyway, it's all it's all kind of good stuff. Um, five more questions. We're going to Rob Parker. This question first one for Joy. He says, "Map placements is really erratic for some of my clients in some verticals right now. Is this just something that happens? Is there anything we can do to stabilize uh, their rankings?" Sorry, you said the first one. Map placements. Yeah, I guess it's map rankings. I guess rankings within the three pack are, you know, yo-yoing up and down, erratic, not consistent. You know, can they do anything about that? So rankings shouldn't be super unstable. Usually they're unstable because of one or two things. One, you're tracking from the city center, which is wrong. You should be tracking on a grid or from a very specific zip code. Um, usually when we see tons of fluctuation, it's because they're tracking from the city center. Um, so that's, that's one thing to check. And then the second time that we see lots of fluctuation, it's because of filtering issues. So if you're in a building with tons of other people in the same industry, uh, or they're just next door to you, we do see lots of crazy shifts. So it's usually one of those two things. Age can also be a factor. So, you know, a GMB listing that's say three to six months old, it's probably not going to be very stable because Google's kind of still testing quote unquote. Um, so that could, that also could be it. Okay. Uh, ben, question to you has come from, uh, oh, hang on, I've just moved. Uh, it's come from um, someone called RM Mooreshead. Uh, the question is, um, if I'm in the GMB dashboard and I move my GMB geo pin from where Google's got it to the actual storefront um, that might be 50, 60 feet away, um, you know, does that, does that have a, can that kind of create problems in terms of, you know, how Google kind of um, sees the kind of quality or the accuracy or the efficacy of your listing? Okay, no, that's actually a really good question. And I think I have an interesting answer for you. So if you're moving it about 60 feet away, you have nothing to worry about. That is a very, very minor map pin change. However, uh, on the maps side of the equation, maps, um, and you have to understand GMB and maps are completely separate entities as far as how they behave. I mean, they're tied together, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> Maps likes the pin to be in the center of a building. GMB likes it to be where your entrance is. If you make a massive change, and by massive, we're talking, I think it's over 600 feet, then it can actually start to recalculate rankings and all sorts of other things. Um, I am not encouraging you do that because that is the quickest and easiest way to get a suspension beyond making changes to GMB. So, and also it'll screw up your driving directions forever. So, um, but yeah, 60 feet, no big deal. Okay. So just to clarify then the map pen is placed differently based on where you're viewing, which, which, you know, application you're viewing the listing through. If it's maps, it's, they place it in the middle If it's GMB specifically, they place it at the entrance. No, Maps likes it in the middle. So, and Maps also controls the driving directions and the walking directions too. So it also calculates how somebody gets to a building. Uh -huh. um, and that's why I brought up Maps in, kind of in the first place. GMB is more kind of, I think, the visual type of layer more than anything else. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Joy, but I believe that's how, it work, how the two function together. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how detailed you want to get into here. There's lots of nuances, but essentially, like when you enter in an address, it tries to match you up with an address point that Google Maps has. Sometimes it doesn't match you up properly. Um, but yeah, other than that, like I think the the, the distance thing that we've seen, um, I would agree with you on Ben. Like minor changes don't make any difference, but major changes could. I've got an awesome question for you, Andrew. This is such a 
Yeah, I don't big, want it. you've got such a big brain. Uh, it comes from Paul Sherland. Um, it's about um, uh, AI. Uh, and he, was, he references a, a talk at a MozCon about how the impact of AI on um, kind of content kind of creation. Um, what do you think is the, the opportunity to use AI for kind of local content, um, you know, at scale? Uh, it's great. There's more and more people coming out with crazy systems to try to try to make it look like it's human readable. And I guess it's just inevitable that 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 stuff gets really good. Um, uh, you still need someone, the, the challenge with AI is, uh, you need someone to kind of, let's just say, program it. Do, what are the rules? Like, and so I guess if you've got someone who really understands, let's say location pages and, um, can figure out how to, um, create a series of rules about how to write a location page and adapt it based on market conditions. Yeah, that might be pretty interesting. Um, seems like a thing that's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, but I guarantee you, there are people out there like trying it. Um, uh, I, I think um, we actually—it's um, funny—we actually so we build our own our own tools in house to do scale stuff, and we actually have a machine learning thing that we're working on to help us do query classifications to help with keyword research, and so. Um, so it only stands to reason that we should be able to do that and try to have it help with figuring out um, what sentences to use uh, over time. Because we've got all these great tools that can say, OK, um, in the top 100 results for, for this keyword, here are the most common phrases that show up. We already have that data. And so we can probably take that and then mush it into something that uh, that a machine might find that makes sense. but. Right now, like the ability to do that is pretty much out of the hands of most people. So I think I'd be much more um, into like, hey, can you create a process so that you can take whatever um, cutting edge data you can get and bake it into your content process, which is still going to be overseen by a human being. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd love to know more about that keyword classification tool. Uh, I, might, uh, I might ping you about that. Yeah. Um, okay, um, let's make this the last question uh, for Joy. It comes from uh, comes from Heath Morrison. Um, I was recently working on converting what used to be um, a physical business to a service area business in GMB. I got prompted with the um, uh, to verify re-verify the listing. Will it hurt the listing if I use uh, will, it, will it hurt the listing if I use a main headquarters address to send the verification postcard to, or does the address have to be within their service area? The address definitely has to be in the area. Like if you use an address somewhere else, that's where your listing is going to rank. So this is the challenge for service area businesses. Often they don't live in the area that they service. So I'd say just go back to Andrew's thing. If that's the case for you, find a small office, cheapest office you can find. Doesn't need to be big. Make sure you know um, you staff it and put some signs up, and then you'll have a lot easier time. I want to say one thing. There is a bug right now with GMB. We're going from a storefront to a service area based business. Um, you have the chance of your address actually being wiped out from Google My Business. You won't know that unless you look in the API. You also have a very small chance of ranking in the center of the country, Kansas. Kansas. It's a that real thing. That happened to us uh, last year. We uh, we started ranking in um, was it something Creek Kansas Falls Creek Kansas yeah yeah, yeah it's Fawn Creek Fawn Creek, Fawn Creek Kansas it was the absolute center and uh, we started showing up in um, Google's travel search <laughs> we were a hotel <laughs> I think we discovered that bug in November I want to say I think it was October or November yeah but uh, but it, it's close to being resolved. So okay. that's a good thing. If this, if this, if this uh, person is sort of suffering from that, should they just contact support? Can support resolve it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. There, okay. there go my Kansas leads. <laughs> yeah. It was basically, uh, you just contact support and AI. You have to, I'll just say it, you have to specifically ask, we manually reset my address. Of course, now you can always have support come back and tell you, oh, but you need to make yourself a storefront. That's when you run away. Oh, okay. Post the right. um, 
Uh, ben, Andrew, Joy, thank you very much. Uh, we have taken up way more time than we planned. Um, we covered an awful lot of ground uh, this evening, uh, or this afternoon, this morning, wherever you happen to be. Um, I can't thank you enough. We'd definitely love to have you back on uh, another webinar uh, later on this year. Uh, hopefully you'll say yes. Um, thank you to so many people who, who, who you know, kind of joined us today and stuck around. Uh, we had you know, almost 350 at a peak point. We're still at 230 now. So uh, that's pretty good retention rate for a webinar of this length. So I hope you guys have got lots of value from this. I certainly have. Um, and yeah, just thank you very, very much uh, from everyone here at Bilocal.